Hello, everyone. My name is Rebecca Parsons. I'm one of your co-hosts for the ThoughtWorks Technology Podcast, and I'm here today with my colleague, Birgitta. Hi, everybody. I'm Birgitta Böckela. I'm a technical principal with ThoughtWorks in Berlin, Germany. And we are joined today by Andreas, who's the CTO and Executive Vice President of Bosch Digital. Uh, Andreas, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and about Bosch? Yeah, absolutely. So first of all, thanks for having me. Um, maybe maybe I tell you a little bit about my my short history in, in Bosch because it's quite untypical. So normally when you're talking to to someone being the, the CTO or EVP of Bosch, they all have this typical Bosch Vita, like being 20 years with Bosch. I can't I can't offer you that. Um so I'm I joined Bosch in 2019 at Corporate Research. Um and then um I was uh, one and a half years later, I was then appointed the CEO and CTO of Bosch IO, uh, where we have been looking into the Bosch um a IoT strategy and where we developed a IoT and IoT related products and solutions. And then exactly as you have said, uh, beginning of this year, uh, I became the CTO of Bosch Digital, which is at least as we call it, which is the, the digital powerhouse of the Bosch group on its mission to drive forward the digital transformation. And before I joined Bosch, um, I, I worked for different software companies worldwide, uh, I think the longest time for IBM, and there was a program director and a senior technical staff member uh, primarily responsible for uh, IBM serverless uh, compute solutions. And yeah, I studied computer science, by the way. Yeah, that, that's, that's me. And uh, I'm from Germany, as you are, so I am aware of, of Bosch uh, who are based in Stuttgart, but uh, can you tell the audience maybe who are uh, not immediately aware of what Bosch does a little bit more about the many things that you do? Oh, yes. And that, that was really hard for me when I joined. I mean, it's not an IT company. It's a company that is so diverse. I would call it a conglomerate, if that translates well. Um, so we do a lot of crazy things. And that makes life exciting. So what is Bosch? So the Bosch Group is an uh, engineering and technology company. It's headquartered in Stuttgart, Germany, so the southwest, um, close to the Black Forest, so some might know that, uh, and close to Lake Constance, which is in summer wonderful. And our strategic objective is to facilitate connected living with products and solutions, exploiting the power of different technologies like IoT, like AI, and so forth. And our um, overarching goal is to improve the quality of life worldwide with products and services that are innovative and spark enthusiasm. And that's why we have our slogan. So we create technology that is invented for life. So this is our mission, right? And we operate in multiple sectors. So now we come to this conglomerate aspect. So we, um, we are active in mobility, mobility solutions, industrial technologies, consumer goods. That's where most people know us from, right? So you may have seen a fridge or a washing machine or whatsoever or a thriller from Bosch already. And we are also active in energy and building technologies. So a lot of different things. And this broad spectrum is what, for me at least, what makes Bosch super exciting because every single day you can learn something new regarding to one of these sectors that I've just mentioned. And of course, all these sectors and businesses rely um, more and more on IT and digital technologies and especially on software. So I can bring in my background to drive all these different topics forward, uh, especially now being in Bosch Digital and just the word on Bosch Digital. So that's an 11,000 um, people organization um, acting around the globe. And as I've said, we are on our mission to help the rest of the Bosch universe to drive forward the, the digital transformation. So we develop and operate products, services, and solutions uh, so that um, all our internal customers can run their existing business and build up new digital business uh, based on our digital solutions. And our portfolio ranges from infrastructure, workplace solutions, um, software development tooling so that the rest of the Bosch group can develop the software they need in their domain and um, so if, even consulting services and products that we jointly develop. So what we wanted to talk about today, actually, there is, of course, so much hype around generative AI and you know, we've got the apocalyptic vision of, you know, the end of the universe <laughs> or the end of the earth as we know it to, oh, you know, nobody's going to have to work anymore because everything's going to be AI and everything in between. And what we'd like to talk about here is let's ground that hype 
in an organization that has the breadth of offerings and requirements and use cases that Bosch does. And tell us a little bit about how this whole Gen AI re- revolution is playing out. Where are you looking at, at using it? Why might those use cases make sense? Um, how, how are you approaching it? So I, I, know, I know that that's broad, but let's just start with the basics of where you're looking at applying it now. And you, you phrased it absolutely correctly. Due to the fact that we are such a big conglomerate, we have many, many different use cases that we have to find a mechanism what to really go after and what not, right? And um, maybe I start with a short description how we identify the use cases we want to pursue, right? So we go, um, I would call it a four-step approach with the team that we have built. And we have, by the way, we have built a team or set up a team that is cross cross business units. That's something that Bosch is not doing all the all day or every day. Um, some so you have to break the silos between these uh, different business units. And we have, I would call it a center of excellence has been set up. And this team um, comprised of people that come from corporate research, comprised of people that come from Bosch Digital, they usually follow by working together with our business units, our internal business units, which are our customers, they follow a four step approach, I would call it. So first, We talk to all of them and we collect all the use cases, all the ideas that they have, no matter if I talk to the power tools guys or if I talk to the uh, consumer goods people, we collect all the use cases. And then we analyze all these use cases. So because what we want to do is we want to um, we want to go for those solutions that seem to be low effort, but cause max impact for a plurality of our customers. So if there's a one use case where we say, oh, if we build that, and if we build it in a very generic way, then we can help not only the one customer, so not only the guys that are working on the fridges, we can help a plurality of our internal customers at once. And so we cause max impact with low effort, so to say. Um, and once we have that clear, we cluster these things a little bit, because when you when you when you talk to all these customers, what you find out very quickly is the needs they have, even so they are in different domains, there are clusters of things that that they all need. And um that is something that you can then build uh, a generic foundation for to then implement their specific need that they have on top. As a consultant, I now have to bring up the word synergies, yes? So you're looking for synergies across your business units. <laughs> yeah, that was the word I've been looking for, exactly. Um, that's that's what we want to do. So we, we listen carefully, we try to detect the pattern uh, that we see, and then once we have seen the pattern, we assess what is causing max impact and what is leading to max synergies um, to make sure that we help this organization the best way we can. And then, of course, we... Yeah, we check the technical feasibilities or some of the use cases. We might find out, oh, actually, generative AI is not the right thing to 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 use here. We can talk about that maybe later because currently I also see this trend or more a problem that everybody is trying to solve the traditional problems now with generative AI. That's something I would not recommend to do. And um, that's just the third step that we do. So we look at all these um, use cases and then we try to check or for technical feasibility and if it's really makes sense to tackle the problem with Gen AI. And then last but not least, we also have to do, I would call it a, a legal status check. So we also check if uh, if we do that with generative AI, that we do not violate laws, that we take care of data protection regulations, and that we do not harm individuals' personal rights, something like that. So this is how we tackle the problem. Use case collection, clustering, assessing the impact, um, making sure with generative AI is the right tool to be used and then checking that we do not violate any rules that we better do not violate. Four steps. And there are also four clusters. So we have been asking for what are I using it for? And um, I keep it first on a more abstract level. And if you want, we can go into more detail what concretely we are doing. So the four clusters. And feel free to ask in between, of course, right? So the first one is what I um, would call the search and summarization scenario, right? So this is all about um, searching or allowing people to search in natural language to analyze and understand large volumes of data in order to to ease and fasten and consolidate access to information. That could be the headline for this. So in this scenario, generative AI enhances enterprise search and 
um, data summarization by allowing to search in natural language rather than keywords, right? I mean, we all probably have this this internal search engine in our companies, right? And well, I'm not sure how yours works, but the most internal search engines that I've seen are not the best ones I've, I've ever seen on this planet Earth. So I think many people know what I mean. And now we have um, we have a new tool here where we do not have to come up with the right keywords. And even better, we are not being presented with this list of links that we all have to open in a new tab and see if the information behind is really what we are looking for. Because now we get not only the opportunity to ask our question natural language, we also get a concise summary of relevant information rather than that list of links that you have to go through manually. And that makes it so much easier and faster to extract valuable insights and to make then at the end an informed decision. So it's the first cluster. Maybe like a, a question about that first cluster, like it's a very common use case that we also see with a lot of our clients. And what are your experiences so far there with, um, you know, we're, uh, with correctness of results and also data quality, right? Because I think a lot of people are, you know, almost having this hope there's this magical data lake now of unstructured information that we can ask questions, right? But the data quality still matters, right? So what what are your first experiences there about like, preparing your data in a way that this gives you added value yeah that's 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 a good one and i i want to be honest here i mean we have just started that and um due to that uh, i think um it's it's more like a gut feeling what i'm answering now um it, i think people are with the experiments we have been doing quite 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 okay but we also see and not only we, we see some of the problems that uh, are quite surprising. Not sure if you've read about that uh, Stanford paper recently. That's very interesting. So you see, for example, even in systems like ChatGPT, that they can even degrade, if that is the right English term. Um, so you see that even so, an answer has been correct back in March, for example. If you ask the system again, it's wrong now because they use reinforcement learning and stuff like that, right? And um, that means the system changes its behavior over time based on the feedback it's getting from the users. And in March, maybe there was a different population, only a small group experimenting with this technology. Now it's the entire world, right? And I'm bored. <laughs> I do not want to judge on the IQ of all people on this planet Earth, but obviously, um, systems are, for whatever reason, degrading to some extent, right? Because they get the wrong feedback. Yeah, or also not necessarily wrong feedback, but, you know, an answer might be useful to one person and not to another person, right? The same kind of answer. And then, you know, was this useful to you? Thumbs up or down? For one person, it might be thumbs up. The other person wanted something else, right? So it's correctness is also subjective sometimes. <laughs> Absolutely. That's a very valuable uh, addition that you just made. And uh, I think the important thing that you need to consider when using generative AI, and that links a little bit to what I was already teasering a couple of minutes ago, it's a very stable technology, right? So due to the fact that it's using reinforcement learning, if you need something, let's say you are working on a use case that is safety critical. I wouldn't use that, right? Because it's an instable technology and um you might run into problems that you do not want to have. And um, that, that then you better use one of the more traditional concepts that uh, give you more security or certainty about the results to expect, right? Um, the second cluster is, um, I would call it the, the chat voice bot uh, scenario. So this is about adding natural language to chats to facilitate um, human-like um, understanding and responding in natural language to, to improve in the actions, right? So in this scenario, generative AI is enhancing chat and voice bots by improving the natural language processing abilities of these systems so that they better understand and respond to consumer or customer inquiries and requests. And that could be internal employees. So maybe we equip our um, IT support, our internal IT support with such technology, but it could also be that we apply this in our uh, service centers, for example, where our external customers are calling, right? And um, this is, of course, leading to uh, a better user experience, no matter if it's an, if it's an associate or an external customer, and uh, to uh, making making people uh, way, way more happy. Um, and this is something we are really looking at uh, at the moment. So we are looking at 
Um, how can we uh, improve our internal IT ticketing system? We are looking at our customer supports and their agents, uh, how we can we assist them. And it's actually funny. So some people think um, if you look at how um, uh, service centers work, some people think there's only a human sitting there and that human gets the call coming in. That's not the case, actually. So usually the voice, and that's nothing new, but now we have a new technology to make it even better. The voice is being split in two parts. So of course, the, 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 the person you're calling hears what you're saying, but at the same time, there is an AI analyzing in real time what you're saying. And of course, now you can put a model behind, a large language model that has been trained on all the manuals, on all the problem tickets that you had before. And while they are talking to each other, the agent sitting there gets in context, in real time, hints what the problem may actually be. So that's an assisting technology. That's something very concrete that we are currently, not only we, you find that all over the internet. It's a very, very common use case currently and very, very helpful. Yeah, and, and the, the nice thing too about uh, using these capabilities, one of the real frustrations with many of those those voice systems as well is, no, you can't use the word uh speak to a representative, you need to say, speak to the pharmacy or, you know, what is exactly the word that is being looked for? And yet with these large language models, I can quite naturally say, I want to speak to a person and they'll route me to a person because whether it, it was, whether they want you to say pharmacist or representative or whatever, all of those things can, can now. And so it becomes much more natural to be able to correspond with these systems. And even if that's all you use it for, uh, is to improve that, that interface from a customer service perspective, that makes a huge difference mm -hmm. to- Makes it fuzzier, know. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are all, I think we all remember these funny systems where, where they, that they are telling you, if you want to X, Y, Z, please say one. If you want to do A, B, C, please say two. Oh, I didn't understand. Can you please repeat? This is a story of the past then, right? Yes. Yes. Um, so the third cluster, and now we get more into the the, the creation of 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 um of content, I would call it. So and I think this is very powerful uh, and very powerful, not only what you may think of immediately like engineering and software development, but general content creation. So I think using generative AI to support content creators, like for example, marketing specialists by assisting with the creation of high quality and maybe even personalized content at scale, this is a super powerful thing to improve efficiency and reduce costs um, while allowing the, the, the creators that originally have been responsible for doing so, can focus more on the strategic tasks. And one project um, where we see this um, currently is um, we, have a, we have a little tool currently in the POC where we um, generate uh, texts for websites in different languages. Um, and so people are being relieved from doing that manually, right? And um, I mean, we can do that in 47 languages. We can just let it be generated what previously people have been doing by hand. Or for example, um, if you are uh, in HR, so we are discussing with our HR colleagues, if you want to generate a job offer, right, a job advert, why do you want to write that by hand any longer, right? Why do you want to write that manually? At, let, it generate, let it be generated by a generative AI. Of course, you need to be careful because we know there might be hallucinations in and uh, also the system has not an easy understanding. So be careful. There might be, I don't know, violent language, harmful language whatsoever in there. So please have a human being um, have a review on that. But still, it's uh, it's better to start on this 80% as a basis than writing something um, on your own from scratch. So that's the, that's the third cluster, the content creation cluster. And marketing is just one example, right? Yeah. And in, in, in fact, one of our colleagues, um, I was talking to him about how he's used it for content creation. And, you know, one advantage, of course, is you immediately get past the the terror of the blank sheet of paper uh, because you've at least got something and it's always easier to edit something that exists than it is to create from whole cloth. Um, but what he also told me was there was one thing 
that he just never liked anything. And, and he tried two or three different prompts and never liked anything that he got back. But he got so irritated with the fact that why can't this model come up with something sensible that that got him over the terror of the blank sheet of paper and, you know, motivated him to, you know, go write something. Um, and, and so I, I do, I do think that that's interesting, but there are so many stories of when people haven't taken your caution into account, please have, please keep the human in the loop. Um, we have lawyers being fined by judges because they put together case law that ChatGPT made up out of whole cloth um, and nobody checked it. Nobody went back to say, oh, does this case actually exist? Um, and I do think uh, even as the technology gets better, we're still going to need a human in the loop uh, for a lot of that, just to make sure that the tone is right. Although I do know of, of somebody, and I thought this was an interesting use case as well. He <laughs> writes a lot of, of blogs. And what he did was he sort of instantiated one of the large language models with his writings. And now it basically answers in the same way that this individual would, would, would answer. And, and, you know, of course, that can uh, apply to organizations as well, where, where you can kind of get that tone of voice, if you will, by saying, you know, hone in on this aspect of the, uh, you know, of, of the corpus. Uh, that's an that's an interesting addition um, to make sure that you that you fine tune the model to to make it more suitable to the way you to, to make it even harder to distinguish that this is coming from an AI. It's not only coming from human, but it even sounds like you, right? Because it it starts to mimic you, right? I've been using GitHub Copilot actually for writing because you know it's like I get suggestions as I type, right? None of the other tools like for writing assistance do that at the moment, at least not that I know of, right? So I've been using it, for example, when I wrote some of the blips for the last technology radar, you know, just getting suggestions and then editing always and double checking, of course. <laughs> wow, you're, you're saying you are not using it for coding, you are using it for writing normal text? Yeah, for, for like for both, yeah, in a markdown file, right? So for articles, blips, and so on, yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. And I like the saying uh, that Rebecca just made on the terror of the blank sheet. That reminds me so much of uh, when I've been a student and I've been sitting in front of my diploma thesis with this blank sheet of paper. <laughs> I, I know this feeling very well. So coming to the last cluster, and I think that's something that is that that is very, very, very known already, so probably not doesn't need a lot of explanation. This is all about engineering and software development, right? And I mean, it's about automating the creation of documentation or even code or writing tools or developing tools that help to detect bugs or security vulnerabilities. And that allows developers to focus on the higher level design, right? And on problem solving tasks, it accelerates the entire development process. And of course, we being Bosch Digital and we, as I've said before, in all our sectors that we are active in, relying more and more on software, that's a very, very powerful thing. And I think we all know these studies that uh, are being out there. I mean, there's been this one study from GitHub that is being uh, quoted very often saying, hey, uh, if you use GitHub Copilot, you can increase our productivity, I think, by 55%. That's the number they've been using. Um, what I, by the way, found very funny is when you look at the study in more detail, what they measured is 55%, right, on productivity increase. But when they ask people uh, what they think, how how more productive they were, they said a number that was way beyond that, so 80% or 88%, which shows that people are not only more productive, they are also happier because they do not need to waste so much time searching for the information that they need to do the actual job they are supposed to do. That is something that I found way more interesting when reading through the study. Um, and by the way, this 55% that was like in their study that they did, there was one task they gave to people, which was create an HTTP server in JavaScript. And this is what that is based on as one example, right? So, yeah. So it depends on the situation, like how much faster you get or if, you know, on, on lots of factors, yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks for adding that, Birgitta. I just want to make a similar comment. This is the, there are not so many studies out there. And I would be a little bit careful with this 55%. So if you start Googling around and trying to find 
a number for a real world project that is running since a while already um, with really a diverse set of tasks and not this one example like you have just explained you don't find a lot uh, we have been looking for that uh, the, the last weeks and so let's see if we if we do another podcast in two years maybe we are a little bit we know a little bit more what the real number that you can expect actually is right so we just talked a lot about exploring the problem space, right? Like collecting the use cases and what types of use cases are there and so on. So what about the solution? So how do how do you at Bosch uh, approach that? So, you know, buy versus build, how to roll things out? Like what are your experiences there in the space at this point? I, I think I touched a little bit on that. So we have this center of excellence, I called it. So we really have this interdisciplinary staff team where people from legal, where people from purchasing, but all the IT cars are in. And we bring together people with the digital knowledge and that are experts in um, fields of AI and software development with the people um, from the business units that are our customers that have the domain knowledge. They know everything about the fridges, the cars, and so forth. And then we bring them together and we we to do things. Um, first, we as Bosch Digital provide the right technology. And that can go into two directions. It can be that we onboard tooling that they need. So for example, maybe it's a very it's a very simple problem. They want to they want to use generative AI to generate our video material, for example. And maybe we then just onboard a tool like Synthesia, for example, because this is able to do that. Then, of course, we need purchasing and legal to see um, how to do that the best possible way. We try to do that in a very coordinated way. So um, what we do not want to end up with is one million one million tools um, for the for the very same um, for the very same problem. But we want to make sure that, so we do not want to end up with a zoo of tools for the same use case. That's the one thing that can happen, that we just onboard tools. The second thing that uh, can happen is um, that we provide them with um, a technology stack um, where we in-house in our own um, data center provide the entire stack that you need, maybe up to the point where we have our own foundation model or large language model or whatsoever. This is not the standard case. This is something we usually do if the data we need to train is um, IP sensitive, then we go that path. If not, we usually use the technology being out there, um, being provided by, by the big players, right? And at the very end, so onboarding tooling, providing the right tech stack, be it on the public cloud or be it in a private cloud environment. And the last thing that we do is we assist them why by the, during development. So we really have our people with their software experience coming in and jointly with the domain experts we really, we really coach the problem, right? And uh, try to come jointly to a solution. That's how we work. So we, we've we we've talked a lot about, you know, the interdisciplinary cross-functional nature of, of, of the teams, but how is this all being received within Bosch? Are, are people excited to use it because it's going to make their job easier? Are they scared of it? Uh, what... What, what what's your sense so far in and how the, the 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 people within your organization are responding to the potential of Gen AI? We see a lot of excitement, and we see that um, the interest is really super high. So almost everybody in all the different parts of the company is starting to do something, right? And um, even trying to take over or claim ownership for the topic, even that happens here and there. Um, and that has a risk, of course, that has the risk of doing a lot of duplicate work and even things a little bit quite risky because it's being done maybe without purchasing or legal um, being part of what is uh, what is going on, right? So what we think or what I think is very important and, and that people are enthusiastic and want to try things out, that's something I like very much, but still we need to be careful because of all the risks that are associated with the technology, like the legal risk, the ethical risk, the commercial risks and all of that. So some governance is being required to get everything that is currently happening under control. But the, the point here is that we need to find a good middle pass so that you allow individuals to have some freedom while at the same time not ending up with a zoo of developments and with a lot of redundant work and with a lot of duplicate work being done. 
Uh, because then the risk is that things are reinvented over and over again, leading to massive inefficiencies. And the goal must be really to allow for a reasonable degree of, I would say, standardization, homogenization, and especially reuse without ignoring the individual needs of different units and forcing them into, into borders. Maybe that just describes it. I also think this is a space that uh, requires um, a lot of exploration, right? And so you also need to keep the barrier to experimentation um, low, right? So that you can actually get people to play around with this in their context, but in a safe way and in a way that doesn't create too much waste, right? So the typical challenge of innovation and experimentation in a, in a um, good way. Absolutely. And now you are touching on what I wanted to, 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 to mention as well. So the center of excellence has on the one hand side, the task that I already explained. So helping all our business units to, to develop the solutions that are Gen AI powered. Um, but they also have some additional tasks. And one is about really um, identifying the risks, really identifying the potential mitigation options and really informing the rest of the organization. So there's also the educational task behind um, about these risks and providing the rest of the organization also with training material and with guardrails and giving them or providing them with a kind of certainty and security what to do and what not to do. And this is something very, very important because especially we at Bosch, we are 420,000 people, I think, um, but not all of the 420,000 people are IT experts, right? So we need to make sure that everybody being part of our organization understands the potential, but also the risks and is being um, assisted a little bit and not left alone to understand what to do and what not to do. And so we are really working hard on developing training material. We do a lot of uh, publishing of articles in our internet. We have so-called sofa sessions, which is like our intern YouTube, uh, where I'm sitting on a sofa, that's why it's called sofa session, um, and try to explain things to, to everybody being part of our Bosch family. And that also helps to address something else, namely fears. So even so, there are people um, that are quite enthusiastic, and I think that's the majority. There are also people um, having fears. And I think the, the most of them, they have understood that this year is not about the launch of Skynet, and it's not about achieving technical singularity, but some are, for example, worried about, is this replacing my job, right? Um, and we know it's affecting more than just IT. We have talked about the examples, right? That it's affecting people in marketing, it's affecting people in HR. But I think the important message, and that's also part of this educational thing that we are after, is generative AI should be seen as an enabling technology augmenting human capabilities rather than displacing them. And it, um, and this is something we have to, we have always experienced human history, right? So we have always seen new technologies automating tasks to free up time for other higher value mental work. Let's call it like this. And what is key, in my opinion, is that people learn to exploit the power of this technology in a meaningful and responsible way, because if you don't do this, you will fall behind from a competition point of view. And um, the the analogy I use very often is, think of two doctors, right? And when I'm asked this question, um, so there might be one doctor that is not using in the future anything related to AI. And it might be one that is using this technology. And the second one might be able to find the best diagnosis and the best treatment much quicker because he can use the technology and all search through all these databases the way um, I've described it with our internal search a couple of minutes back. So he will be more competitive. He will be at, at, he has an advantage, a competitive advantage over the first doctor. And so it's essential if you want to survive with your business that you really learn how to deal with this with this technology in a responsible way. And that's uh, means for Bosch, for example, we are working on our AI codex where we really um, define the, the rules of the game, right? Uh, what to do, what not to do. We even provide our employees with protection mechanisms. So we have a tool that is called AI Shield um, that really checks um, the prompt before it's being routed to an external system to see if we really want to let that go out 
not to not to control our employees, but to protect them from ending up with a case that we have all seen on the press from another company a couple of months back, right? Where some engineers thought it's a good idea to have uh, IP sensitive data in the prompt. That's that's things that we do, and we see that even on the political level currently. I mean, out of Brussels, we see um, all these thoughts around the AI Act being driven forward because we all see uh, that there are risks associated with this. So at at, at the beginning. I, I mentioned the, the range of opinions between, you know, the world ends tomorrow and, you know, the, the tech utopian dream. Where do you personally sit on, on that? You've, you've mentioned that you, you don't think Skynet's going to happen tomorrow. Um, but what, what you just said tells me that you are seeing this as, as a valuable way that we can enhance the human experience as opposed to degrade it. Is, is, is that a fair, fair uh, characterization? Yeah, ab- absolutely. If we use it responsibly and if we use it right, right? And um, I, I already touched on that um, uh, a couple of minutes back. There are also use cases where I really would encourage people to not use it. So, for example, if you are think of a traditional classification task, right? There you wouldn't use generative AI or of when you think of non-generative tasks, where it's not about generating new content based on existing one, right? There you better use our reinforcement learning or traditional machine learning. Uh, generative models do not make sense. Or maybe you want to look at these things from a cost point of view. I mean, training these models, right, and running them at the moment this requires a lot of computational power, right? So it's quite expensive, right? Or if you want to have real-time or low-latency applications, well, then again, it's probably better to use one of the more traditional um, technologies. Or maybe you don't have a lot of data. Um, I mean, generative AI requires a lot of data. Look at ChatGPT and large language models. It has been trained on the entire text corpus of the internet, actually, right? So if you don't have enough data, you can't use this technology. And we already touched on things like trading instability, right? The system can change their behavior. um, And if it's um, changing behavior, it's also not suited for um, safety critical systems. Still, I think generative AI will continue to accelerate in the context and in the scenarios and in the examples that we touched on a couple of minutes back. And I think it will accelerate even more because I see that what I call the democratization of AI will continue. What do I mean by that? Um, Democratization of AI for me refers to that the AI technology becomes accessible and affordable to a right range of people not necessarily being experts and um, this happens because there is a simplification of AI tooling and everything you need. I mean, a couple of years back, you really needed to know everything about the algorithms behind and, and so forth, right? Meanwhile, you can download a model from Hacking Face. Um, you can deploy it on some AI platform, and that's it, right? The second thing is, which will even make it accelerate, um, is I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced that the compute power being required to train and run will significantly decrease over the next years. And then even more and more open source models will come up, which currently is due to their associated costs not happening so much. And I think what it will be interesting, and probably we won't find the answer to that one today, is I, I'm very curious what will happen the next months and years when looking at this ongoing war between the really large general purpose and the specialized small models. Who will win? That's a very interesting question, in my uh, opinion. Um, So let's see in in one or two years from now. And the second thing that um, I'm very convinced of here is, uh, which also needs to be proven, is from an end user perspective, I'm totally convinced that generative AI will change IT systems as we know them today. So I'm totally convinced that every system or tool will come with a natural language interface that allows you to verbally describe your problem or the task to be performed. This is what we already see in GitHub Copilot, but I'm talking about every tool. So think of Adobe Photoshop. You will just write, okay, can you please uh, edit the photo that uh, I've currently loaded like the following. Can you please exchange the sky and make it a blue sky instead of the gray sky I'm currently seeing, right? And the tool will understand what you're talking about and will do it. And this will happen when you use PowerPoint. You just write some text and say, can you can you create me some slides that are deal with the following topic? And even so, it might not be perfect, 
you don't have the terror of the blank sheet, as you call it before, right? So you can just, you have something to start with and that will help. So these trends, I think, will 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 continue. The democratization, the, the, the less um, compute power being needed will accelerate this technology and we will see this war between the large language models, the small ones, and we will see how in the very end, um, this will cause a huge change for how IT systems work and how they are being made accessible, even for non-IT experts by using this technology. Yeah. Yeah, and this democratization and having this natural language interface in all applications, uh, that will mean like great power for the users, right? And with great power comes great responsibility, right? And technology is not just happening to us. We can decide as users and as people how we're going to put up guardrails and what we're using it for and whatnot, right? So we'll have to see how how well we will deal with this responsibility <laughs> if it will be for the good effects or the bad ones or somewhere in between, yeah. Absolutely. And what I think is not a good idea because this has never worked out in human history is these, I'm not sure how you, how you think about that, but this idea of stop research, right? Let's not continue with that. I mean, someone will do it. It's, it's super naive, right? I, I, when I'm being asked what I think about that, I usually use uh, an analogy saying that's like the Tour de France, right? Like um, the, the big cycling event taking uh, place in France every year. Everybody uh, uses stuff he or she not yet should better not use because they are all afraid somebody will use it as well. So I also need to use it, right? Because otherwise I'm not competitive anymore, right? And the same thinking will probably happen when we look at this technology. Somebody will do it because somebody will think if I don't do it, the others may do it. So I better do it, right? And maybe I do it in my in my garage, nobody finding out, but it's, I think it's very naive to do, to, to, to say, okay, let's better stop research on that until we exactly know how it works, how we can control it and uh, for what is allowed to be used or not to be used. This is an idea I personally find very naive, right? Well, that answers the next question I was going to ask you, which was what your position on that is. So thank you. Well, Andreas, this has been a fascinating conversation. It's it's great to hear how this is actually playing out with people trying to run a business and take advantage of, of this technology. So thank you so much for, for joining us today. And um, we'll, we'll, we'll make a note to, to come back in a year or so and, and say, okay, so how did these things turn out? <laughs> um, because I do, I do think uh, we, we are going to see a lot of advances. Uh, we're going to see a lot of uses that we haven't really even thought of yet um, because the barrier to interacting with this AI is so so low that that democratization I think is going to be a, a source of of tremendous innovation as people who are not traditional technologists, traditional computer scientists are looking at this technology and oh see, this is this is what I can I can do with it. So thank you, Andreas. Thank you, Bergita. Um and uh I hope our audience has enjoyed this exploration of generative AI within a context. Thanks a lot for the invitation. <laughs>